Hi, my name is Dan Zeilinger, and I have been a world traveling full time trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of my most memorable performances were on the lawn of Edinburgh Castle at Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials across the world. I've met many people during my career and have spent many hours on stage and off with these musicians, talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on the weekends with friends. I think they all have stories worthy of a movie script. And through these interviews, I'll be sharing them with you. This is Dan Zeilinger for Trad Jazz Today. And my first guest is old friend, not that he's friend, or, but our friendship is certainly old. Uh, trombonist, banjo player, uh, comedian, um, Steve Allen scholar, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, here he is, Mr. Bill Dendel. Hi, hello, Bill. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? You like that intro? Was it appropriate? I thought it was fabulous. Good. Did you, you like the, You left out the bit about the nun and the pliers, though. You, you're right. Uh, but I hadn't been under that piano for a long time. <laughs> oh, good. Well, it stay that way. Um, the, I kind of want to do a, kind of a general kind of question and answer or question and, and ramble, depending on which one of us is talking. Uh, rambling would be me, by the way. Uh, uh, just about life stories. And you now, you were born in San Diego? No, New, New Jersey. New Jersey, I'm sorry. I mean, oh. <laughs> Camden, in fact. Camden. Why does that sound familiar, other than the fact that Corey, Booker was, Corey Booker was the mayor of Camden. Okay. Okay. Did that have, have anything to do with you leaving? Uh, no, he wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, what, what brought you into San Diego? Do you really want to know? Uh, that's why I'm asking. Um, my mother moved us to San Diego in 1954. Okay. Her mother and her sister had moved there, and she wanted to be close to them. Okay, that was the same year I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, so I'm surprised our paths didn't cross. <laughs> we might have met on Route 66. You, you never you never know. I got my kicks there. Oh, this is going to oh. be awful. What can I We're say? We're playing the Motor West. That's, you know, very <laughs> You, now, you were saying in your bio, because I, I, I actually did some research on you, like I don't know you well enough, uh -huh. that uh, you, started playing, you started playing banjo in 63. True. And then in 67, you were at Mickey Finn's. True. What happened between those years? I learned how to play the banjo. And, <laughs> and, and how did that happen? Uh, actually, I took my banjo lessons at Mickey Finn's. I studied with Don Palta, the Flying Dutchman. Sure. And I actually took my lessons uh, most of the time in Fred Finn's closet. Oh, so many straight lines. I know. I, I <laughs> love that for you. you know, he had a big walk-in closet, and it was a place where there was room. So we took a couple chairs in there, and Don gave me lessons. Wonderful. And how did trombone come into the picture? Trombone came into the picture after I moved to Monterey in 1968 where I was the lead banjo player at Capone's Warehouse on Cannery Row. After about six months of playing banjo five hours a night, five nights a week, I was getting pretty tired of the banjo. Sure. And I had always liked trombone. And oddly enough, I had learned, uh, I'll demonstrate, I have a horn nearby. Just don't play anything I've got to pay ASCAP royalties on. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> But anyway, I had a good friend in high school, just one, and he played the trombone. So he lent me a trombone once because I was uh, engaged to uh, wear a marching band uniform because there was only one trombonist in the band. Ah. So for an important gig, they asked me to put on a uniform and carry a trombone and be on the right front. He was on the left. Sure, the guide. Yeah. So that's what I did. And I pretended to play, but didn't actually. But uh, he let me hang on to the trombone, which was fateful because I learned to do this. Spike Jones lives. 
the Spike Jones noise. <laughs> so uh, I learned how to do that basically about five years before I learned to play the trombone. So I'm at Capone's warehouse and playing banjo all night. I bought a trombone and applied what I knew from the banjo. And voila, I ended up a trombonist. Wow, that, that, that would make sense. I want to back back up okay. to, uh, to, to Fred Finn, so, uh, Mickey Finn's uh, club. And I just, the earlier, yes, I asked you, um, his interview is going to be dropping tomorrow. I just interviewed Phil Andreen. Oh, yeah. And he's kind of a, a alum of the Mickey Finn show, too, I guess. Yes, that's where I first met him. He did some, he did some gigs with the Finn band. Uh, I don't know if he was ever full-time at the club, but I, I saw him with the band sometimes. Well, he told me that he, he kind of replaced Cougar. Yeah, he was in that, that period just before the band went to Vegas. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I, the, yeah. I guess he told me he, how that conversation came up. It was he told me that one of his uh, friends told him he was the loudest trombone player he ever heard. And I said, you, I bet you have to compute, compete, compete with Cougar Nelson for that one. And we got into the whole conversation about making I'm sure you did. So yeah, I had some adventures with Cougar. Yeah, uh, uh, a character. Yeah, he was a unique, I hope, person. <laughs> Westy relayed some things to me about Cougar, too. Oh, but. boy. Uh, I did a, a uh, oh, gosh, it was about a month gig over in Laughlin, Nevada, in a casino, in a band with Cougar, uh, Steve Johnson, and Tony Sandoval. And Cougar got to the gig early, because we stayed in the hotel. Cougar got there a couple days before everybody else so he could get the room closest to the ice machine. Okay. <laughs> to keep his beer cold. He would bring a case of beer into the room every day and then drink it. Okay. So he did a case a day, at least. At least. And as you got closer to the board, it turned into a quesadilla, probably. Uh, now that's a little too cheesy or, you know, <laughs> for, for me to make. Don't, don't. Yeah, yeah. I was also surprised to read that you weren't the first leader of South Market Street. Yeah, that, that's, um, how did that happen? My, my friend that lent me the trombone, he actually had a Dixieland band, didn't have a name. And when I heard, and this, this goes back to why I played the banjo, which you didn't ask, but I'll tell you. you remember Midnight in Moscow? Sure big hit record in 1962. Right. I heard that and it just popped, popped my mind open to music. Nothing else had excited me. Well, it was a top, it was kind of a top 40 hit. It was a huge hit. Bigger in the UK than here, but still it was, it was major. And so I went to my friend, Tom, and I said, uh, do you guys play, can you play Midnight in Moscow? He said, yeah, we're working on it now. And I said, well, what instrument don't you have in your band? He said, well, we don't have banjo. So I took the money I saved from my uh, paper route and I went to a music store and I bought a banjo. And that's what ruined my life. Why didn't, you, ju why didn't you just do a GoFundMe page? I'm kidding. <laughs> would, would that they existed. Uh, one time at the, at the Sacramento Jubilee, Dave Jones, who was the original clarinetist with Kenny Ball's band. Uh, he was with a band, another band, and they were right before my band. We, had the, we listened to their set. When we were in the changeover, I approached him and I said, Dave, do you ever see Kenny Ball? And he said, yes, I do once in a while. And I said, well, I'd like you to give him a message for me. I want you to tell him that I hold him personally responsible for the fact that I have no money. <laughs> Dave, who's a big guy, picked me up, laughing hysterically, and gave me a bear hug and said, I'll tell him. But there is truth to it. And he ball just in, the same thing happened to Rusty Styers. Yeah, I have to blame I have to blame uh, uh, Dan Barrett for me, but that's okay. Okay, well, go ahead. <laughs> Dave, Rusty had Rusty had the same experience? Well, not exactly the same experience, but 
the, the thing that got him into trad jazz and excited about it was Kenny Ball, Midnight in Moscow, that album. Oh, okay, I, I figured it was because his mom was a piano player and his dad played sax, right? That, that's true, but that's maybe, that, that may have gotten him started in music. What got him excited was right. Kenny Ball. You know, talk that's, that's a great cut. Oh, well, and the whole album, the recording of High Society on that album, it's still the most exciting piece of trad jazz I've ever heard. It's just wonderful. You know, it's a, a, a lot of it's just plain testosterone. I talked to, I talked to Larry, St uh, Larry Wright about, about that, the fact that so what's missing in a lot of, of older jazz uh, players, j older jazz musician, sorry, older practitioners of take three, players who play old styles of jazz, there we go, mm -hmm. is, is the fact that they do it without a lot of passion. And, and people forget that at the origins, these were all teenagers playing their version of rock and roll. Exactly. Trying to pick up the girl in the audience. Yes, exactly. You know? Well, I, I think there's a school of uh, traditional old time jazz. It's played by people who are fixated on the time period and the culture. And their goal in playing the music is to try to recreate what it would have sounded like. And in the process of doing that, which is an intellectual exercise and an analytical exercise, they miss out on the, on, they can, they don't all, but you can, it's easy to miss out on the, the excitement and the joy and the testosterone of it. I always find out what's interesting about that approach is the fact that, that the recordings, although they existed, they were limited because of the, of the recording wax cylinder. Right. And because you, know, like, you couldn't use uh, loud drums and right. you couldn't play, uh, you know, and they, so they do little animal noises and, and uh, uh, a cymbal bell or something for, it. so if they're, Basically, what they think is off of recordings, they're, they're sadly mistaken. Well, the, reproducing the recordings is one thing, but reproducing the recordings is not reproducing what the band sounded like live. Well, that's what I'm saying. For the exact reason that, you're, that you've expounded. Yep, I agree. So the fact that I'm using the name Trad Jazz today on my um, YouTube channel is just the fact that you can't say Dixieland anymore. Well, I understand that. And and I think I, I was I think George Probert had it correct when he decided to call it the Monrovia Old Style Jazz Band, and all of a sudden that, you know, that was a, a bit of genius on George's part, who I also miss terribly. Well, that's sufficiently descriptive for anybody to understand that you're not going to play bebop. <laughs> True. Old style. Of course, then then you have the question of what is new style. Well, I think uh, one of the one of the um, Things, conclusions that Tomas and I came to was the fact that it's usually the scholars who put the dividers in music mm -hmm. and the musicians just are playing whatever whatever their hearts desire. I mean, we were talking about the improvisation in, in the classical era and things. So it's fascinating. I didn't realize he had told me in Monteverde when was, that he would write the lead line and the bass line and tell everybody else to fill in. Okay, why not? And they, so... They, so that gives you an argument for when jazz started, you know? Well, it, it gives you an argument for when improvisation right. became prominent. Um, Joe Madiri has an interesting uh, idea about that issue of what makes jazz jazz, because t we tend to think of it that the improvisation is what made it jazz. But he points out correctly, and as you just did, that improvisation existed long before jazz. Uh, Joe's take on it is that the difference with jazz was that the instruments were no longer, uh, the instrumentalists were no longer just trying to play their instruments correctly or properly or in tune, but were using the instruments uh, in a way to approximate vocalization. Oh, okay. So we were the doing, doing the kinds of things that singers did particularly uh, African-American singers, blues singers. People were taking liberties with things, making different kinds of sounds, uh, uh, assigning vague time values to things. 
and that that was really what made it jazz. So uh, that's do you, do you remember one of my favorite quotes of yours in one of our <laughs> one of our many long discussions at your house. Uh, was uh, the definition of jazz itself. Do you remember what you told me? No, not at all. You said, if you think you're playing jazz, you are. Uh, I, I, that's sort of a Jerry Fenwick uh, thing. He said that to me. <laughs> uh, it, when he was teaching at San Diego City College, he would tell the students, that the, the number one way to identify jazz is if it's the people's intention that that's what they're playing. I've, I've got to tell you uh, that you're a big you're a, a big hero of mine, and 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 taught me many things that I still use, especially in teaching. Wow! Uh, and one of them, one of the big ones that that hit me over the head was to start with what the student already knows. There you go. That okay. was, I mean, a more brilliant word of advice to me has never been spoken when it comes to the teaching profession. And I'll tell you where I got that. Anne Shea Bear who was a professor of education at the University of Hawaii. She wrote a book called Collaborative Apprenticeship Learning. This is my Bible. You saw how quickly I reached it. I noticed. And uh, her approach to teaching was, it was five steps. The only one that really mattered was number one, which is start with what the student knows. Brilliant. And, uh, at the jazz camp, that's what I've told everybody who's ever worked at a jazz camp where I was around. You, you can't have any expectation that people are coming to you to be taught that they already know something. Right. So the first thing you have to do is figure out where are they and then move them. You'd be interested, I hope, in uh, <laughs> the application that I use that in uh, most often is because I teach a lot of marching bands and marching organizations, as you know, and we'll be outside and spread all over the field. And then I'm also talking to um, the brass section uh, normally, and I talk about, okay, imagine you're on a baseball field and tubas, you're in the center field and um, trombones, you're on second base, trumpets, you're on the pitcher's mound. I want you all to throw a baseball and hit the catcher so it hits him at the same time. When do you have to start your throw? Okay. Because all kids play baseball. And they say, well, the guy in the outfield has to start sooner. I go, well, that's the length of a tubing for a tuba. Ah, uh, yeah. And, and they all go, oh. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So, and that's thanks, thanks to you and, you know, our conversations. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> it, it applies. It applies to even, even to jazz band. Yeah, absolutely it does. No. That's an interesting fact. Tell me some of the people who went through South Market Street as musicians. Ooh. Well, the original band, we had a 50th anniversary. You weren't there. No. At the, the I wasn't studio. asked. I would have been. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it would have been great if you had been. You could have taken Ken Donica's place. Uh, we were at the uh, San Diego Festival in 2014. We did the 50th anniversary. The band started in the fall of 64. And um, the original band, Jerry Fenwick was on trumpet, Larry Oakman. Okay. Dale I just Sarri. worked with him recently. Yeah, he's still doing it. Dale Sari was on trombone. Uh, I was on banjo. Ken Donica was the tuba player. Uh, Tad Wolicki was the drummer. And the original pianist was uh, Dr. Jerry Rosenberger, who, of course, we called Doc Rosenberger. Okay. He, uh, he lasted a short while because we were all fractious kids and he was an adult human being, although he had his moments. Uh, and then Bill Hunter actually was the next pianist to join Bill's, one, Bill's lovely. And he was the one who served the longest in the band because the band did have, it ran really pretty much from 1964 to 1995 with a brief moment in the early 70s or mid 70s where everybody was busy getting college degrees or making a living or something. But uh, that was the original band. Uh, Joe Lukasik played clarinet with us for a while. Evan Christopher was on clarinet for a while. Uh, Bob McEwen. By the way, Evan's gonna sign up to do the show too. So I know. It's great. I, I saw him in New Orleans in January. 
Uh, it was delightful. It's been so long since I saw him. Uh, what a great guy and, and a wonderful musician. And he'll tell you more than you ever thought was possible about <laughs> jazz because he knows everything. Oh, he's yeah. a really, as you know, we've, we've known him a long time. And he's... Uh, Hi, Shelley. <laughs> Hello. Good to see you. You too. <laughs> That's my wife. Uh, <laughs> The best one, the last one. Now, what was I saying? Sorry. Evan. <laughs> Evan's a brilliant guy. And uh, he applies that brilliance to whatever comes to his mind. And he's done a wonderful job of it with jazz. We had, we had a great conversation in New Orleans. Anyway, I'm glad he'll be there. But he, he played in our band for a while. Uh, the only two trumpet players ever were Jerry Fenwick and Flip Oaks. OK. Uh, pianists. We had Dr. Rosenberger. There was a guy named Sal Ferrantelli, oh. who um, I could send you a recording of. He's, he's on a recording we made in 1968. Uh, let's see, it was October of 68. So that's 1060. No, it was 66. Okay. So it was 1066. So I call that recording the Battle of Hastings. So for history buffs. Anyway, uh, Jim Hessian played with the band sort of when we were at our, our first peak, when we were doing a lot of work with Disney. We were on the Ted Mack Amateur Hour, uh, Regis Philbin show. We, we did USO tours back in those days, uh, late 60s. I wonder if there's I, footage of, of, the, of the Ted Mack show. I know there was on Tom Kubis. I wonder what that's uh, like on you. That's what led me to contact the uh, Library of Congress and get, I have the, uh, I, I have the, uh, the shows. We, we did two shows. Okay. And I got both of them. It cost me a lot of money, but it was worth it. Mainly for the commercials <laughs> and, and, and to hear all the other strange people that were on the shows with us. Was that Ovaltine that sponsored? I don't remember. Anyway. Who? Ovaltine. No, no. It was Geritol. Oh, Lotteridge spelled backwards. I'm just that, kidding. That, exactly right. <laughs> or <a> Ceratan. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, the, the South Market Street Jazz Band was a, uh, was a big part of my life for many years. And it did change over the years. <clears throat> Tell me a little bit about the USO tour. Well, there were two of them. I only did the first one, which was uh, 67. We did uh, six weeks, four weeks in Vietnam, two weeks in Thailand. Uh, it's a real good way to lose weight. Now, Larry went on that one, right? Uh, okay. That was Jerry Fenwick, Larry Oakman, Dale Sari, Tad Walicki, Ken Donica, and me. Okay. Or I, one of us. You should know. I do. And uh, <laughs> so it was uh, pianoless. And uh, we were all at that point, either 20 or 21 years old. And they dressed us in fatigues. And since we were young, we didn't look like a USO show and there were no women. It was just six guys. So they sent us to places that usually didn't get shows because they weren't safe enough. Closer to the action. Yeah, very close. So, uh, yeah, there were some interesting moments. Uh, I'm one of the few musicians I know who's been tear gassed while performing. Oh, I know a lot of musicians that have been. In a, in a war zone and well, in true. a nightclub. That's so true. It, it, it's very rare. <laughs> Uh, yeah, in fact, the uh, the place where we got tear gassed, I had bronchitis. We did our show in the afternoon. It was a, an artillery base called Hamtan. And we did our show, and then I just immediately was going to go to bed because I felt terrible. Uh, we were billeted with the officers. There was a bunk bunk bed in the room. This officer took me to the place, got me settled in bed. And then he said, I'm going to go back to the officer's club. Here, he handed me a pistol. 
automatic pistol. I don't remember what game, you know, it's like 44 or something, big thing. And he said, uh, if somebody comes through that door wearing black pajamas, shoot them. Now yeah. get some rest. BC, yeah. Yeah, so I, I sat in bed like this, pointing a gun at the door. He's, he's lucky he got in, made it, but uh, it was, a, it was a, an interesting and frightening experience. How were the audiences? Audiences were great. They enjoyed what we did. Uh, I don't know how many of them were actual trad jazz fans, but that band was very energetic and uh, they enjoyed it. And there were still people who knew Hello Dolly, Cabaret songs that sure. were hits in that era. So um, we were well received and they were just glad to have something to relieve the, uh, the tedium. And a lot of them were stoned. Well, what can I say? It was the time. It was the time. It was the time. And so that brings us to Capone's. Capone's Warehouse. Now you've told me some wonderful stories about the things you were pulling on your bandmates at Capone's. Yeah. Well, really a few of those. <laughs> well, let me first tell you how I got the gig in the first place. Good idea. Uh, on my wall, there's a photograph of Louis Armstrong and I together. Okay. Right, right, right over there. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, that photo was taken backstage at the first Monterey Dixieland Festival in 1968, May. Uh, South Market Street Jazz Band was there. So was Louis Armstrong. We were backstage. Uh, for the afternoon concert on Saturday. And he and his band were there and we were there. So I walked over. I had met him previously at Disneyland a couple of years prior. Uh, this is a true story. I, I believe I met, you. I, bet it, I met him at Disneyland. I was introduced to him. And we spoke for a few minutes, told him I played the banjo. And we, we just had a nice chat. About two and a half years later, at this Monterey Dixieland Festival, I approached him backstage. He was just standing there. And I, and I said, Mr. Armstrong, hello. You, I'm sure you don't remember me. And he said, Bill, you play the banjo. He remembered meeting me. I, I was blown away by that. Uh, Tad Wolicki had his camera with him. We got Danny Barcelona, who was sure. uh, Lewis's drummer at that time. Filipino. No. So <laughs> anyway. The uh, Danny Barcelona, Barcelona. He was Filipino. Yes, it's true. True, and and, and a really nice man. Um, anyway, where did I go wrong? No. <laughs> so that was the we played that festival, and it was great. We had we had fun. The Dukes of Dixieland were there. Firehouse Five, uh, Louis Armstrong, lots of good players. It was great fun, and I never got paid. It went bust. I didn't get any money. The person who had hired me was a guy named Dick O'Kane, who owned a nightclub on Cannery Row. And I kept calling him saying, hey, where's the money for my band? And on maybe the third or fourth phone call, he said, what do you play? And I said, banjo. He said, you want a gig? <laughs> Excellent. So I said, goodbye, San Diego and South Market Street Band. And I moved to Monterey and played banjo for you know, off and on for nine years at Capone's Warehouse, where uh, one of the things that happened was that I got bored playing the banjo. So I, I actually learned how to play trombone. I also worked on piano. I learned to play tuba and drums. And I played guitar. I even played cornet a bit. But uh, this is leading up to what you spoke about. Sure. Uh, Practical jokes. We well, had some fun. Involved in what you're saying, I was also curious how you met Eddie. Eddie Erickson showed up one night. He was, uh, he was playing in uh, San Jose. There was a club there similar to Capone's Warehouse, which is like Mickey Finn's or your father's mustache or you know, all of those other. R Rosie O'Grady's, whatever. Yes. Rosie, you know, all of those, every town had one. Uh, Eddie was at Scarlet LaRue's in San Jose 
the owner of Scarlet LaRue's was a guy named Bob Lassley, played banjo and piano. And he, he was totally impressed with Eddie, who was very talented, very young. And he brought him down to Monterey because he thought the cocaine might hire him. So he came and sat in, and we had a great time. Uh, Eddie and I spent about the first 20 minutes we knew each other being competitive and having a rivalry, which we, we got over fairly quickly. I mean, I'm literally, it was within the course of our first night together. Um, really enjoyed playing with each other. I was the hotshot banjo player from San Diego. He was the hotshot from San Jose. He was a little younger than I. But we were both, I was 22, he was 21. So we were sort of up and coming banjo players at the same time. So anyway, he, uh, he, he did get a gig and he came down and played at the warehouse and uh, we worked together and had a great time. So that's, that's how I met him. Uh, <laughs> <all right. laughs> Shelley's teaching a vocal lesson in the oh, next room over. I thought you had an extra musical phone going off. I wasn't sure what was going on. Uh, yeah, if you, if you hear piano or vocalizing, that's what's happening. So uh, anyway, that's how Eddie and I met. OK. Next question. Well, it was about uh, the kind of gags you used to play on each other or the band in general. Oh, my gosh. Well, one night. <laughs> Eddie used to do a song, Play Fiddle Play. When he got done with it, uh, we had hooked up a wire. There was a, a light booth on the other side of the room. We hooked up a wire that went from the light booth at a, at a down angle to above the stage. And we had a hand, a big stuffed hand that Eddie and I, in fact, had made. We sewed it at my house, stuffed it with stuff. There are stories about that hand. <laughs> anyway, uh, we gave it to, we put a pulley on it in a, a bar. We gave it to the light man. When Eddie got done with his solo, I would say, let's have a big hand for Eddie Erickson. And he would put it on the wire. And while the, the crowd was applauding, it would come down this wire and fall on Eddie. So... That was just a, a usual thing that we did until one night when I brought a, a, a turkey carcass <laughs> right after Thanksgiving and we put the turkey carcass on and it came down and fell on Eddie. Well, he, he wasn't thrilled with that. He got his uniform greasy. So I did my big solo, my banjo solo. At the time, I think I was doing the Oklahoma medley. And at the end, it was you know, ridiculously fast, too fast to be music. And as I was strumming the big final chord, Eddie reached over with wire cutters and cut my strings in the middle of the, ta-da, it stopped. Blink, 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 blink. Plink, yeah, it was, uh, it was abrupt. Uh, what else did we do? Silverware? Well, that has, that's the piano player. The piano was open. The front was taken off of it. And one night I came in early. The, the piano player was Dave Tobiason. Okay. He also played sousaphone. He was a good tuba player. And the sousaphone was hooked up on a pulley and a counterweight. So it was above him. So I got into work early one night. I pulled the tuba down. I filled it with water. Put it back up. And then I scattered silverware on the action of the piano on the inside. I went to the drums, there was a drum set. I loosened the bass drum head and there was a cornet that hung on a hook. The trombone player used to use it on occasion. Doug Curtis was his name. I've switched the valves around in the cornet. Oh, good. I detuned Eddie's banjo, which was on a stand on stage. Anyway, I kept everybody off, off the stage until it was literally 30 seconds before we were supposed to start. And then we all ran up on stage. I turned on the floodlight, counted off the first tune, and we started. 
and nobody could play but me. The, the piano was just cacophony from all the silverware bouncing around. And then, and Eddie couldn't do anything because he was out of tune. The drummer's bass drum, when he'd hit it with the pedal, it would go The cornet would make no sound, of course, at all. So anyway, after we all got done laughing about that, <laughs> two songs later, I had Dave do his, uh, his sousaphone piece. He pulled the sousaphone down, blew into the sousaphone, which moved the water, but made no sound. He stopped, the water moved back, blowing air in his face. He was totally confused. He thought I'd hooked up an air hose or something. Anyway, so he dumped it out on me once he figured out what was wrong. I mean, this sort of stuff went on all the time at Capone's Warehouse. It was, uh, it was an insane place to be and great fun. By the way, if you, if you see Eddie, tell him I'd like to get him on the channel. Oh, absolutely. I rarely see him, but um, through the magic of smartphones, yeah, you know, I do occasionally have contact with him. One thing that's happening through this and is the fact that a lot of people, nobody's putting their contact information on their Facebook anymore. And a good majority of my friends are, are my only contact with them is on Facebook. So I either have to ambush them on Messenger like I do with you, or, uh, or I just uh, hopefully that they find email because I don't get any phone numbers or email addresses or are really hard to come by. Now that takes us to my next question for you, which is, okay. do, you remember, do you remember the very first time I played with you. The very first time? Oh, we're moving while I think about this. Because I'm, uh, I'm probably annoying Shelly by talking loudly. So we're going to go to another room. See, we're going down the hallway right now. I've never been to that house. I'm having a nice tour here. It's good. Yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, uh, there's, a, there's a baby picture of me right there. <laughs> Oh, here's a rare one. We'll go in here where it's quiet. Where was the first time I played a gig with you? Well, not necessarily a gig, but played with me. Uh, would it be at a jazz society meeting? No, no, no. Uh, jam session? And there's a reason I'm asking you for it, about this. It was actually the Banjurama in Sacramento. Oh, my gosh. Wow. I was there playing a, a duo with Brad and you guys, I think either follow, you must have followed us because I hadn't met you yet. And of course you knew Brad and uh, I came off the stage and some point in time you asked me to, if I'd like to come back on and sit down on a tune and you played all the things you are. <laughs> that was kind. Yeah. You know, I figured that now that I look back and in retrospect, it was that, I'm sure it was a trial by fire uh, for you all just to kind of test my mettle. And, uh, but that was it. it was... Whoa, I, I have no memory of that at all. Oh, it's vivid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. It, I, I must have impressed you and somehow because eventually I was, I was sitting with you with the magic hat and all, the, all different kinds of things. And, uh, and that led of course to our, our gigs after that. You know, I was thinking about one of my favorite gigs of all time. The band was a quartet. You were on tuba, Flip Oaks on trumpet, Westy on trombone, and me on banjo. The Wild Animal Park. Wild Animal Park, the White Alligator Jazz Band. Wasn't that the birth of Spal? Uh, I think he thought it, it up at that gig. It could be. It could be. But... Uh, I remember I, uh, I enjoyed telling the audience that while we were only a four-piece band, <laughs> we weighed as much as most six-piece bands. Right, we were eating for eight or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, I was, well, I was the little guy on the band, and I was close to 200 pounds. But uh, Flip and Westy and Dan. Oh, were, Dan was in there. Were uh, more corpulent than I. Maybe not talent-wise, but I was big as the rest of them, you know? <laughs> But it was a wonderful gig. Uh, the most enjoyable thing about it, I think, was 
was watching people because we we played in an area where people were eating. It was a sort of restaurant patio area. And when we would have Westy play a number on his hand, in fact, he would just ask for a request. Nobody knew what was going to happen except us. And then whatever they requested, he would play on his hand. And watching people pausing with their food halfway to their mouth going, what? Yeah, for those of you out there who are, who are watching this who don't know who Westy is, I'm surprised you're watching this, first of all. Yeah. And the second was he was a delightful tuba player, trombone player, comedian that could play an octave or two octaves, uh, maybe three, now that I think about it, doing fart noises on his hand. Yeah. And he would do that to audiences without any warning. Very musical, by the way. But uh, the, the best I ever heard him do, Shelly and I met at the Sacramento Jazz Camp in about 1993. In 1999, we got married at jazz camp. Westy played the wedding march on his hand. <clears throat> and he, he didn't do any- I didn't of, know that. Yeah, he didn't do any of the glissando effects or you know short bursts that he used to do. He did it just as musically as he possibly could. And it was actually, you know, compared to what he usually did, it was beautiful. But I thoroughly enjoyed the look on Shelley's mother's face while that was happening. It was my, I first, uh, actually, I, I mean, I've seen uh, Shelley perform long before um, you guys were dating. But I remember the first time I was watching her and the Marie Callender's in Pismo Beach with you. I think I had Ryan, I think I had Ryan sitting next to me. And I had, I had no idea that, that you had been dating. And you looked at me and said, Dan, what do you think? And I said, I don't know. That boop, 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 do stuff goes really, that doesn't go very far. I had no idea. And, and you sort of looked at me like, and I knew right then that I had stepped into a big pile of something. <laughs> but. Well, uh, reminds me of one of my favorite song titles. I've never fallen in love, but I have stepped in it. Yes, or uh, I stepped in a pile of, what was it? I stepped in a pile of you and got love all over me. Something like that. Yes. That's another good one. Or how, do, how, how, do, how, can I, how can I miss you if you never go away? Yes, right. Uh, I don't know what I'd do without you, but I'd rather. <laughs> <laughs> Some of your signature jokes, signature, Most uh, things, people... that, uh, things that I still use. Well, I, and I do too, because With I my can't... students mostly. Yes. Uh, well, I, I sort of, well, not sort of, I, I had a reputation for uh, all those stupid song titles that I used at jazz festivals in the 80s and 90s. And mm, I don't think I made up any of them. I stole them from everywhere. That was the thing about the Wild Animal Park is you had uh, some funny people with awfully quick minds. And one of my favorite moments when I made you laugh was when you got on the mic, you said, I call my girlfriend hinges because she's something to adore. Yes. And from the back line, I said, then why do I call my girlfriend knobs? Uh, yes. And, uh, and gave me, you gave, of course, shot me an, an appropriate look. But uh, it's well, always, it was always fun to banter, especially between you, me, and Westy. I figured because you couldn't handle her. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh, God. I wish I had a comeback for that one. <laughs> But but that was I remember poor Flip, <laughs> yes, because because it was you, me, and Westy, and he yeah. would just he'd roll his eyes and 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 you want to play, and and here we are bantering yes. on the stage for minutes. Yeah, and it, it did drive him nuts. He wanted to play music, I and mean, he's got a sense of humor. Oh yeah, uh, he's a brilliant guy. In, in fact, one of my best teachers ever. Was Flip Oaks. I remember we talked about um, his impression of his own sound on trumpet. You were telling me once that Flip could never satisfy himself with his sound. He had this he had this image of 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 a cross between uh, you know different players in his head, and that's when you realize. And this is another one of these lessons I learned with you guys. 
is not everybody, for example, I, if, if you see a color red, you may be able to identify it as that color, but that doesn't mean you're seeing the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. And Flip had that concept down. I remember he, he used to come over to my house because he was, he was building the prototype of his trumpet, the wild right. thing. And you know, he, he was working on that for 15 years before we ever saw a prototype. But he, he had bits and pieces, and he was an instrument repairman, so he had the capability to move things around. He would show up at my house with a new lead pipe. I remember one day, and this is the day when, the, the alert, when this happened, he, uh, he showed up and it was lead pipes. He put one lead pipe in his horn and he played. And then he said, now listen to this. And he switched to the other one and he played. And I said, Flip, sounds the same, it sounds like you. And he, he looked very frustrated because he, he heard, and then I thought, he hears the difference. I don't. That was enormous. I mean, that, that concept, if you extend it, uh, really fits a lot of situations for understanding that somebody's perception is not the same as yours. And as you say, with colors, it could be different, but it fits, it fits the, the whole spectrum. Sure. Things that people can perceive differently. Uh, and, and, it's for, and it's for different reasons. You yes. Know, yes. The, the, we keep forgetting, boy, in, 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 a, in a mega way, that not everyone is like us. Right. Or nor do they want to be. No, nor should they be. And it's, it's, it's kind of a, and when you apply it to that kind of thought uh, of the sound of, somebody's, uh, sound of somebody's horn or how they, for example, when I started doing these recordings, I hear my voice much deeper than it is. Uh -huh. And it, it always kind of shocks me when I listen to recordings of myself speaking, because that's not what it sounds like to me. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's normal. You know, Shelly's a voice teacher. She gets people who think they can sing. You know, they, to themselves, they sound like Frank Sinatra or Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> but uh, out here, it doesn't sound like that. I, I just can't get that Ella voice down. <laughs> no. Do you know, by the way, I just recently read that Alan Funt uh, uh, proposed to her and she refused to marry him because she didn't want to be Ella Funt. That is that is now that's a Bill Dendel joke, right? That's not. I guess it is. Yes. It's it seems like I'm telling you something real. Well, but I'm not. There's a lot. There's that's one of the keys to humor, and we'll kind of get around that uh, as soon as I tell my joke, which is. Um, I heard this. Let me. I'll do a little sort of setup, and I may have told you this at some point in the past, but I don't think so. Which is I was playing a, a party with a bunch of guys for a Swedish re, high school reunion party in Newport Beach. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. And they all went, they all went, okay, good. Well, I'm going to say it anyway, because I think it's funny enough to tell. Ah, yes. They all went to high school together in Sweden. And every year they go to a different person's house around the world now and have this reunion party. And we got hired to play it. And everybody's laughing. Of course, the comedian they brought over to entertain the crowd is Swedish and was speaking in, in Swedish. And we were sitting there completely confused. Finally, the hostess came up and said, would you like to hear the jokes he's telling? She said, I, we said, sure, yeah. Said, well, let me tell you his last joke. And it's the old three men in a bar, an Italian, a Frenchman, and a Swede. And the Italian looks at the other two guys and says, you know what we like about Italian women in our country? And the other two go, no, tell us. He says, we like the fact that when they sit on bar stools, their feet always touch the ground. But it's not because our women have long legs. I'm sorry, it's not, it's not because our women, it's not because our bars have short stools, but because our women have long legs. And the other thing we go, ah, ah. The Frenchman says, well, that's nothing. In France, we, with our women, when we put our hands around their waists, our fingers always touch. It's not because we have big hands, because they have such small and delicate waists. Oh, and the Swede says, well, you know, in Sweden, in the morning when we go to work, we pat our women's on the behind. When we come home from work, their behinds are still wiggling. And it's not because our women have fat behinds. It's because we have such short work days. <laughs> okay, yes. Yes. One of my favorite jokes of all time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And I know well, and it and it and it leads to perspective again. Well, and and the reason you like that joke is because you, you, it, it's it's a left turn at the end, and you don't know that it's coming. That's the best kind of joke when you get surprised by it. That's great. Which takes us to your yeah. your um a lot of your humor and a lot of who you are as as a personality came from your love of Steve Allen. Can we talk about that a little? Yeah. Uh, I became aware of Steve Allen when I was about 10. He had a TV show and he just killed me. The things, and it was the, the way he, he played with language that, that really knocked me out. I, I enjoyed that. Uh, I remember once he was just talking to the audience and he said, and so-and-so did this, and I was flabbergasted. And if you've ever had your flabbergasted, you know how painful that can be. <laughs> I like this guy. He did, a, he did a song once. He used to do a bit where he would make up a song based on a, a, a newspaper headline. He'd just bring a newspaper, pick an article, and sit at the piano and make up a song. And he wrote, he read a, uh, there's a newspaper article about somebody who was riding a motorcycle and their girlfriend fell off the back. So he, he wrote a song about a guy who had a girlfriend named Ruth. And they went for a ride on his motor scooter and he hit a bump and she fell off and he drove off ruthlessly. Another left turn. I love that stuff. Uh, once uh, I saw him uh, doing a big band concert in San Diego. It was actually the first time I met him. Uh, Tony Murillo was playing drums for the big band and had done his show before. So he got me backstage to meet Steve. Uh, Steve was tired. He was sitting in a chair. He wasn't all that interested. But I told him that I had read that one of his goals in life was to have a complete set of everything Robert Benchley had ever written. <laughs> and I said, I did it. I have everything. And he, he perked right up and we had quite a chat about Robert Benchley, who was a favorite of his and of mine. Uh, and I remember one of the songs he did at this concert, he turned to the band leader, it was Benny Holman. And he said, Benny, this, uh, this, song, this chart has a four in front for the intro, yes? And Benny said, yeah. And he said, he turned to the audience and said, okay, you four in front, you got the intro. <laughs> that, that was... If you don't think I'm not using that one. It's all yours. <laughs> Steve won't mind. Oh, God, that's wonderful. And, and there's, so, there's so much... Um, I'm trying to figure out how to connect this next thought. And I guess I don't have to be the king of segues, but then you had asked me to come up and be uh, at the beginnings of the, of the Mammoth Lakes Jazz Camp. Yes. And a lot of people don't know that I was there for, I think three years or until I ran off with 10th Avenue. I, I'd say about three years. Yeah. That was, I, that was a great experience. Yeah, the Mammoth Lakes Jazz Camp was, was uh, a big learning experience. Yeah, I managed to see Ken and Flossy at the last LAX festival and, and uh, yeah. chat with them a little bit, but. Yeah, so they were great. They were, um, they really were invested in doing the camp. And they knew that I had a background in education. Uh, that, and in fact, my master's degree was in curriculum. So I remember Ken, uh, Ken liked to tell this story. He came to me one day and he said, we're thinking of doing a jazz camp. Uh, why don't you start thinking about a curriculum for one? And I said, Ken, it's been on, it's been on my computer for the last eight years, but, which is true because I had been working at the, uh, the Sacramento camp. And of course, the very first thing I did when I went to the Sacramento camp, it's, it's a habit that I have, whatever I get involved with, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's musical or it just doesn't matter. 
uh, one of my character flaws is that I try to find ways to do it better. I'm constantly thinking about how can what whatever is happening, how can it be better? Right. So I was looking at what was happening at the Sacramento Jazz Camp and actually writing down how I thought it would be improved. And the end result of that was a fairly fully realized curriculum, which we imposed on unsuspecting children at the Mammoth Jazz Camp. Oh, I thought you said it was, I thought you were gonna say that the thing that made it better was hiring me. <laughs> well, I could say that, sure. <laughs> well, uh, you, 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 know, you have the same, that, that same uh, quirk in your personality. I mean, you, if, you, if you're handed something, you immediately start looking at it from other sides. How else could we use this? We do that with words a lot, but it's, it's, uh, that's another thing that, that I kind of picked up from Steve Allen, because whatever he said would almost immediately turn into some kind of joke, word-based humor, because whatever was said or whatever he said or whatever he read, he would hear the words any other possible way they could be heard. Well, one of, the, one of the big things is, as you know, is, is you start listening literally as opposed to what, what the intent is of the sentence. And quite often, that's, it's really bizarre. Well, I think it's interesting that you would say uh, intent when we're talking about camp. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I didn't see it coming. Uh, well... But that's an illustration yes. of how it works. Whatever anybody says, somebody says intense, you don't hear intense, you hear intense. Which reminds me, it's time for you to explain your duck quote on our, on our messenger. Or which quote? I, had, I said, how's your hot dog? Oh, yeah. And then you replied. Oh, I don't recall. What did I say? Do I have to look it up? And then you said, I'll, I'll look it up here. Then you said, I'll explain later because I was completely lost, which is not rare for me, but here we go. I'm gonna, I have it here in a second. Okay. Um, go ahead and, uh, and uh, vamp. Well, you know where that came from. Oh, duck food. Oh, duck food. Yeah. Well, first of all, how's your hot dog? Came from your son. That was his first pun. He was four years old. And we're sitting at dinner and I said, How's your hot dog? And he said, okay, I'll get some popsicle sticks and I can glue it together something for the, you know, a house for the hot dog. When I said duck food, you remember the Ferry Landing Marketplace on Coronado Island? Sure. Did you ever play that gig? No. It was usually a duo and uh, I'm surprised you never, you must have been running around the world with 10th Avenue at that point. So, or something, yeah. Because uh, there was a bass player named Ted Hewart, who was the brother of a fairly famous jazz bass player named Jim Hewart. Ted lived in San Diego, and I used him on that gig occasionally. And once we were moving from one place to another, and there were ducks around, they were attracted to a, a water a uh, pond that was there in the shopping center. And there, we were walking by a window of a store and it had a sign that said, duck food. Okay. And he looked at it and he said, Bill, duck food. And I said, that's good advice. <laughs> and he almost dropped his base laughing. And it was just an example of hearing it another way. Okay. But uh, in fact, I saw him at Dick Lopez's funeral years later. And he, he af after the ceremonies were over, we were talking and he said, you're not gonna remember this, but you gave me one of the biggest laughs I ever had in my whole life. And I said, I remember, <laughs> that was it. And he, st and he started breaking up again. He just thought that was hilarious. Uh, if you think about it, if you're going to play jazz, improvised music, your job is to respond to what's going on around you in some original way. 
So that just, proves, just not by playing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer all the time, but actually no, put some thought to it. It's not Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> it's the Brady Bunch, which I got from you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, you should be thinking creatively based on what's going on around you. Uh, my, my problem has always been that I'm not musically a great creator. So uh, I fell into the... the trap that Paul Smith, the pianist, landed in, which is quoting, making songs fit where they shouldn't. Right. Quick story about that. You remember Stu Cooper? Sure. And John Kitzmiller. Yes. We did a trio gig one time, and we were getting into the quoting thing. We were playing Mama's Gone Goodbye, which is an interesting tune to, to try to fit quotes into. Anyway, so we, we, we each soloed on it and put in as many quotes as we could. John took the last solo, and then it was time to go back to the tune. None of us knew what we were playing. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. That, that definitely happens. So and John, John was, because he had such a good ear, uh, you could easily lead him astray by quoting because he would, he would depart from whatever song you were actually playing and go on with what you quoted. So it was fun to do that to him. He was a delightful guy, a good tuba player. Absolutely. So what's, the, what's the future of the jazz camps look like now in Sacramento? Well, we had to cancel it for this year, of course. Uh, in fact, this morning I was working on trying to piece together what it'll look like next year. Uh, it's gonna depend a lot on what schools look like. I know, I, right now, I mean, I haven't been working since this hit at my yeah. schools. Yeah. And I have no idea what the future is, you know, with the, with the supposed next year coming up on me, so. Yeah, and it's coming up fast. Uh, I, I have been in touch with uh, the campground where we do the camp. It's a, it's a school campground. Okay, I've there. never been to the Sacramento one. So. Oh, well, it's beautiful. You'll, we'll have to arrange that sometime. Uh, it's, a, it's a school camp, you know, with the cabins and the dining hall in a beautiful bucolic setting. Uh, and I, thought, I thought it was bucolic's day off. No. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Uh, I had a baby with bucolic. Uh, <laughs> They just put them underneath the blue light and everything's okay. Yeah. Spew colic. Anyway, uh, the County Office of Education is working on what, how they're going to have their program. And they're talking about things like arranging the cabins so that the beds are foot to foot, so that people's heads are far away from each other, uh, eating in shifts in the dining hall, so that they can leave six feet between. Sure. Uh, so anyway, I'm looking at uh, having fewer kids in the camp per week, uh, doing all the rehearsal spaces outdoors rather than in rooms. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's so much to be considered. Uh, and despite what we plan, the intervening months are gonna tell us what we can or cannot do. Uh, doing the camp uh, virtually, uh, I, I don't know how well that would go. It, it, it's, it's almost not the point of the experience. Well, that's exactly right. Because uh, as I tell people, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story that I often relate when we're talking about that camp. Uh, every couple of years, I have the same experience. I'll be walking along going to the dining hall or up a pathway and a kid will fall in step with me and we'll just walk along in silence and they'll say Bill I say yeah they say this isn't really about music is it and I say shh don't tell anyone <laughs> because it isn't and I don't care what kind of camp you're running if you're doing it right, it's really about how to be with other people successfully 
being supportive, being supported, being kind, uh, working together. That's really what a camp is about because you can't learn a whole hell of a lot in a week or two weeks. No, it's true. But you can have a life affirming and positive experience and inspiring experience. And so that's, that's uh, what I, that's what my vision of the camp is. Yeah, there's music and we work on music and we coach them and we give them information, but it's mainly a place to have a successful positive experience with other people. Absolutely. You so, know, I, um, when I teach my, uh, my marching band camps and, and uh, drum and bugle corps and things, yeah. one of the things I, I point out to, especially to the parents, is I'm not, I don't, I'm not there because I care about whether or not we win a contest. Right. What I'm really there for is to try to help make better adults. Because when I get too old to cross the street, I want somebody who's kind enough to help me. Exactly. Like, you know. That should be everybody's job. Well, kind of, you know, uh, at the old meaning of life, uh, I finally figured out the meaning of life, I tell people. And they say, well, what's that? I said, the fact that life is a, a, a indeterminate entity that goes forever in the past and forever in the future. And if you look at our lifetime as a speck on that line, the only possible explanation would be that we're supposed to make it better. Exactly. Because there's not going to be legacy. There's not going to be name or remembrance. All you can do is make the person next to you, make, have them want to make the person next to them, have them make, and so on. You know. Well, my, my hope is, and, and you'll share this, I know, is that someday in the future when I'm long gone, somebody's grandchild that I know now is going to repeat something that I told their grandfather 30 years ago. You must be getting the same thing I do every so often. And you'll all of a sudden you'll get a child of a, of a next student. I've had grandkids. That just that just knocks me over when that happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, life goes by fast. We talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. What's um? I think it was Franz Kafka wrote a <laughs> short story, of, and a character in it. It may not be Kafka. It wasn't, I, I it wasn't in Metamorphosis or. That was, it wasn't in meta metamorphosis, <laughs> but something else. Anyway, uh, a character in literature who spoke that he felt the passage of time like wind in his face. And I've never forgotten that because it's getting windier and windier the older I get. Yeah. Wind speed is picking up. My wife compares it to a roll of toilet paper. Oh, good. As you get nearer the end, it goes faster. I, I, I've had this similar discussion with the students, and I talk about uh, how when you're three years old, it takes forever for Christmas to come around again. And when you're my age, it, it, you seem like you just put your wallet back in your pocket before you're getting it out to buy presents. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Well, there is something fairly logical about it, which is that when you're in your 70s, as I am, you're not yet, uh, one year is a small percentage of your life. Exactly. It's when perspective you're 10 again. years old, it's one seventh, which yes. is much bigger. Yeah, I use the exact same comparison. When you're, when you're three years old, one year is a third of your life. Exactly. Right. And when you're 66, like I'm going to be here soon, that it's... Oh, happy birthday. No, not for Valentine's Day. My birthday is Valentine's Day. I expect a present. Okay. <laughs> you won't get one for me, but you can expect a present. Someone will give you one. Now, just just for, um, I'm pretty much done with the bulk of what I wanted to talk about, but uh, we're going to, like I said, we're going to be editing ends and things. Uh, well, mostly ends. But my sister used to live in Carmichael. She just passed a couple of days, a couple of years ago, and, and my brother-in-law both have passed. Uh -huh. They have a house in Carmichael, and Aaron and Carrie have been coming up. In fact, they're coming up this next weekend to settle the estate and, and go through the thing. So they're, they're going to be around. I won't be with them, or I'd come by and visit. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, Carmichael's not far. Yeah. It's just over there. <laughs> oh, ho did I ever tell you? Uh, I'm sorry. One time in, I was in Costa Mesa, and I was riding around, and a new bar was opening up called Hoagie Bar Michaels. 
Oh, great. Well, and so I got off my bike, went in to ask about a gig, possible gig. And I walked up to the person behind the counter. I said, excuse me, I noticed, uh, I was wondering if you guys were going to have music in here. He goes, oh, no, we're, we're just, just going to be kind of a sports bar. I said, well, your bar's called Hoagie Bar Michaels. He goes, yeah, Mr. Bar Michael opened it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. You One can use the, that. When, whenever uh, it's I'm true. With, a, with a group that does a Hoagie Carmichael tune, Shelley likes to sing Sk Skylark. Sure. Jubilee, some others. And I would say, now here's a song by Hoagie Carmichael, who uh, had a famous sandwich named after him. The famous Carmichael sandwich. <laughs> Again, oh, the things we do for showbiz. Uh, one of my fond memories is flying to jazz festivals, on, usually on Southwest or Alaska and writing limericks or song titles on barf bags with you, passing them back and forth. That was a that was wonderful way to pass time. Yeah, that's how Wesley and I came up with half of his routine. That's yeah, it. yeah. But was... uh, yeah, limericks were good. We, we need des desperately uh, with, before the year's over to find some way to connect and, and hang out again. Um, oh yeah. This well, is getting well, the, the, our our discussion today is getting a little bit too long to download almost. But uh, <laughs> I I was you know I did an interview how this all got started is I did an interview for Aaron's Drum and Bugle Corps, um, and because they wanted to talk to me about what it takes to design a show and I used to write music for them all the time and I had mentioned in passing that uh, when the drum corps first got uh, organized I was on a getting off a plane from Hungary, with or I met Tomas. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what was happening. And he goes, oh, what were you doing in Hungary? I said, oh, I'm a professional Dixieland tuba player. And the host stopped in his tracks. He said, what? I didn't even realize that was a thing. <laughs> and so he asked me to come back. And I actually did a whole interview with him just about me and my career and, and then how it applies to drum corps, of course. But after, after having an interview with him, and he was pretty good. Um, but I, I never felt it was organic. It was question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. And I prefer conversation. You yeah. can still interview, but uh, if you, there, there's, a, there's a difference between, okay, thanks, here's the next question, and actually saying something to which the other person can respond, an organic conversation. Yeah. Much more interesting to listen to, I think. So after seeing that, my son said, you know, dad, you need to do a YouTube show where you interview all of the friends you've met over the years. And that's how this whole, whole thing got started. It really was Aaron's idea. And he's really is doing majority of the production and contacting and, and uh, came up with the idea for the intros and things. So, Yeah. And I taught him how to spell my name. You did. I know. I know. You know, I saw that after, the, after he sent the email. And I was thinking, oh, boy, this is going to be. He talked about it today on my way here. Well, you know, when you have a weird name. No, I have no idea what that's like. Yeah. Well, nobody's actually. I know of two other Bill Dendels. It's interesting. One of them uh, lives in Texas and owns a plumbing supply company, mm -hmm. but he's on the bo board of education in his community. Okay. The other one was at the University of Hawaii where Ann Shea Bear, who did uh, collaborative apprenticeship learning was, he was involved in health education. Okay. I've never met either one of these guys, but I'm, I'm aware that they exist because I thought for years I was the only one. Yeah, that's, well, it's kind of like uh, young Eddie and old Eddie, huh? Uh, oh, Eddie, right. Eddie Erickson at Disneyland and, and Fast Eddie. Now, I have, I have two channels right now up on YouTube. Uh, one of them is called Daniel E. Zeilinger, and that's uh, full of slideshows and memorances of what's happening with my cherry, with the cello, cherry willow band I'm in. I've got mm -hmm. on slideshows on uh, on Tenth Avenue. I've got some slideshows on Miss Behaven. Some on uh, I posted some uh, things on Pat Denise. I don't know if you've seen that site. So I've got that one, and I've got this one, Tragedies, Tragedies Today. But if you don't put the E in Dan Zeilinger when you search, you get an Austrian bodybuilder. 
<laughs> wow. Have you thought of building an Austrian body? So, so, so there's another Daniel Zeilinger that has a, a YouTube channel that says Daniel Zeilinger. So Zeilinger, I thought was German. Well, it, yeah, it's close enough. Well, it's about as German as you can get with the EI. So, yeah, but and Austria is right next door. So. Well, you know, they 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 uh, trade recipes and things. So. They do, as a matter of fact. Well, let me do my little outro here. You have any last thoughts you want to lay on the public? Last thoughts. I hope they're not my last thoughts. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> that reminds me of the Bill Dana routine. <laughs> no, the thing that I is would that your crash helmet? Since this, no, it's my head. Oh, Bill Dana, is that your crash helmet? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Yes. Uh, I forgot that. Uh, Jose, can you see? That's Dale, that's Bill Dana. Uh, since it's trad jazz, I want to I want to say that trad jazz gave me the opportunity to meet some absolutely amazing human beings, to make music with them, uh, to know of absolutely brilliant and thoughtful and wise and funny people. Uh, what I think what draws people to traditional jazz varies enormously, but the people who don't who do play it and have spent you know their lives doing it tend to be really interesting people. Their minds tend to range far and wide, and tend to be artistic in more way than one. And I just I really appreciate the opportunity to know people like Dan Zeilinger or. Lee Westenhofer, Rusty Styers, uh, oh, and Mark Curry said to say hello. I'm working on a project with him. Uh, just brilliant people. I, I got to play with Bob Haggard, met Louis Armstrong, played once with Nick Fatool for Pete's sake. Uh, I played a set once with Ben Pollock. Okay. And Warren Smith. All of these guys were brilliant and wonderful people to be around. Some of them were curmudgeons, but uh, just so much extra joy came into my life through the music, and it still does. So there. I'm. I'm by the way, we we're toying with the idea of doing a Westy Westenhofer week. Oh please! Uh, to get to get a whole bunch of people to tell stories, and and I've talked to actually talked to Sharon about the concept. And so it, it might be an interesting thing to do. I want in. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> all right, Bill. Thank you all for watching Trad Jazz Today with Dan Zeilinger. Make sure you subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Videos come out every Wednesday and Friday.